The Law of Success, Lesson Ten: Pleasing Personality. You can do it if you believe you can. What is an attractive personality? Of course, the answer is a personality that attracts. But what causes a personality to attract? Let us proceed to find out. Your personality is the sum total of your characteristics and appearances, which distinguish you from all others. The clothes you wear, the lines in your face, the tone of your voice, the thoughts you think, the character you have developed by those thoughts, all constitute parts of your personality. Whether your personality is attractive or not is another matter. By far, the most important part of your personality is that which is represented by your character, and is therefore the part that is not visible. The style of your clothes and their appropriateness undoubtedly constitute a very important part of your personality, for it is true that people form first impressions of you from your outward appearance. Even the manner in which you shake hands forms an important part of your personality and goes a very long way toward attracting or repelling those with whom you shake hands. This art can be cultivated. The expression of your eyes also forms an important part of your personality, for there are people, and they are more numerous than one might imagine, who can look through your eyes into your heart and see that which is written there by the nature of your most secret thoughts. The vitality of your body, sometimes called personal magnetism, also constitutes an important part of your personality. Now let us proceed to arrange these outward mediums through which the nature of our personality is expressed, so that it will attract and not repel. There is one way in which you can so express the composite of your personality that it will always attract, even though you may be as homely as the circus fat woman. And this is by taking a keen heart interest in the other fellow's game in life. Let me illustrate exactly what is meant. By relating an incident that happened some years ago, from which I was taught a lesson in master salesmanship, one day an old lady called at my office and sent in her card with a message saying that she must see me personally. No amount of coaxing by secretaries could induce her to disclose the nature of her visit. Therefore, I made up my mind that she was some poor old soul who wanted to sell me a book. And remembering that my own mother was a woman, I decided to go out to the reception room and buy her book, whatever it might be. Please follow every detail thoughtfully, for you too may learn a lesson in master salesmanship from this incident. As I walked down the hallway from my private office, this old lady, who was standing just outside of the railing that led to the main reception room, began to smile. I had seen many people smile, but never before had I seen one who smiled so sweetly as did this lady. It was one of those contagious smiles because I caught the spirit of it and began to smile also. As I reached the railing, the old lady extended her hand to shake hands with me. Now, as a rule, I do not become too friendly on first acquaintance when a person calls at my office, for the reason that it is very hard to say no if the caller should ask me to do that which I do not wish to do. However, this dear old lady looked so sweetly innocent and harmless that I extended my hand, and she began to shake it. Whereupon I discovered that she not only had an attractive smile, but she also had a magnetic handshake. She took hold of my hand firmly, but not too firmly, and the very manner in which she went about it telegraphed the thought to my brain that it was she who was doing the honors. She made me feel that she was really and truly glad to shake my hand, and I believe that she was. I believe that her handshake came from the heart as well as from the hand. I have shaken hands with many thousands of people during my public career, but I do not recall having ever done so with anyone who understood the art of doing it as well as this old lady did. The moment she touched my hand, I could feel myself slipping, and I knew that whatever it was that she had come after, she would go away with it, and that I would aid and abet her all I could toward this end. In other words. That penetrating smile and that warm handshake had disarmed me and made me a willing victim. At a single stroke, this old lady had shorn me of that false shell into which I crawl when salesmen come around selling or trying to sell that which I do not want. To go back to an expression which you found quite frequently in previous lessons of this course, this gentle visitor had neutralized my mind and made me want to listen. Ah, but here is the stumbling point at which most salespeople fall and break their necks, figuratively speaking, for it is as useless to try to sell a man something until you have first made him want to listen, as it would be to command the earth to stop rotating. 
Note well how this old lady used a smile and a handshake as the tools with which to pry open the window that led to my heart. But the most important part of the transaction is yet to be related. Slowly and deliberately, as if she had all the time there was in the universe, which she did have as far as I was concerned at that moment, the old lady began to crystallize the first step of her victory into reality by saying, I just came here to tell you, what seemed to me to be a long pause, that I think you are doing the most wonderful work of any man in the world today. Every word was emphasized by a gentle though firm squeeze of my hand, and she was looking through my eyes and into my heart as she spoke. After I regained consciousness, for it became a standing joke among my assistants at the office that I fainted dead away, I reached down and unlocked the little secret latch that fastened the gate and said, Come right in, dear lady, come right into my private office. And with a gallant bow that would have done credit to the cavaliers of olden times, I bade her come in and sit a while. As she entered my private office, I motioned her to the big easy chair back of my desk while I took the little hard-seated chair which, under ordinary circumstances, I would have used as a means of discouraging her from taking up too much of my time. For three quarters of an hour I listened to one of the most brilliant and charming conversations I have ever heard, and my visitor was doing all of the conversing. From the very start she had assumed the initiative and taken the lead and up to the end of that first three-quarters of an hour she found no inclination on my part to challenge her right to it. I repeat, lest you did not get the full import of it, that I was a willing listener. Now comes the part of the story which would make me blush with embarrassment, if it were not for the fact that you and I are separated by the pages of this book. But I must summon the courage with which to tell you the facts, because the entire incident would lose its significance if I failed to do this. As I have stated, my visitor entranced me with brilliant and captivating conversation for three-quarters of an hour. Now what do you suppose she was talking about all that time? No, you are wrong. She was not trying to sell me a book, nor did she once use the personal pronoun I. However, she was not only trying, but actually selling me something. And that something was myself. She had no sooner been seated in that big cushioned chair then she unrolled a package which I had mistaken for a book that she had come to sell me, and sure enough there was a book in the package, in fact several of them, for she had a complete year's file of the magazine of which I was then editor, Hill's Golden Rule. She turned the pages of those magazines and read places that she had marked here and there, assuring me in the meanwhile that she had always believed the philosophy back of that which she was reading. Then, after I was in a state of complete mesmerism and thoroughly receptive, my visitor tactfully switched the conversation to a subject which, I suspect, she had in mind to discuss with me long before she presented herself at my office. But, and this is another point at which most salespeople blunder, had she reversed the order of her conversation and begun where she finished, the chances are that she never would have had the opportunity to sit in that big easy chair. During the last three minutes of her visit, she skillfully laid before me the merits of some securities that she was selling. She did not ask me to purchase, but the way in which she told me of the merits of the securities, plus the way in which she had so impressively told me of the merits of my own game, had the psychological effect of causing me to want to purchase. And even though I made no purchase of securities from her, she made a sale, because I picked up the telephone and introduced her to a man to whom she later sold more than five times the amount that she had intended selling me. If that same woman or another woman or a man who had the tact and personality that she possessed should call on me, I would again sit down and listen for three quarters of an hour. We are all human, and we are all more or less vain. We are all alike in this respect. We will listen with intense interest to those who have the tact to talk to us about that which lies closest to our hearts. And then... Out of a sense of reciprocity, we will also listen with interest when the speaker finally switches the conversation to the subject which lies closest to his or her heart. And at the end, we will not only sign on the dotted line, but we will say, what a wonderful personality. <laughs>